want to take advantage of the time we have together. So we're just going to get Mr. James Harris from Million Dollar Listing LA, is where you might know him most. He's at the agency in Beverly Hills. And we're going to have a lot of fun right now and then break for happy hour where we're going to go have a, go have a great time. So Thank Mr. You. James Harris here. Thank you. High energy. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, you Thank you. Finished, I want to just say for everybody that's here, it means you're ready to listen and you're dedicated because it's 4.20. And nobody wants to be here for eight hours, so thank you for sticking about, and we're going to have a lot of fun, so thank you. Thanks for having me. Well, hello, boys. Hello. How what, are you? What's going on, man? It's all going on. It's good. I'm grateful to be here. Thank you. And uh, when Daniel called and asked me to speak today, I said, what's it about? He said, it's the Be Different conference. I said, fuck it, I'm in, <laughs> because I think I'm very, very different. Whether it's good or bad or indifferent, everything about me is different. What makes you different? Everything. You know, I set my business up in Los Angeles seven years ago. Uh, I'm going to start back because I just want everyone in the room to know a little bit about me. Uh, I was born in London, single mother, poor thing. I had behavioral issues at school. I was expelled from eight schools. Although I was asked to leave, my mother told me, which means that my mother pulled me out of the school before they actually expelled me. I didn't go to university, and I was always hungry to learn and eager to make money and try and make the best out of what I had. So I pounded the pavements in London. At the age of 15 and a half, I had no resume. So I went into a payphone box. I took a photo of myself, and that was my resume. And I found an estate book, which was a real estate book, it was a directory, and highlighted the companies I was interested in working for, and pounded the pavements, and the first one I walked into, I said, hi, I'm James, uh, I'd love to talk to the owner, and he said, that's me. And we ended up having about a 45-minute conversation, he hired me on the spot, and that was where my real estate career started at the age of 16 awesome. in London. So, 16, is that legal? It's not. No. <laughs> it's actually not. So it was a lot of fun. Uh, and there's a crazy journey that went from there that led me to Los Angeles. But uh, we'll get into that. Good. So take us, actually, take us deeper into that. You got it. Is my next question before your, the uh, biography piece wraps, which I want to know more of because it's extremely interesting that with that background, you end up in Los Angeles. <laughs> and in such a competitive market and then end up where you're at. It wasn't always that easy. And so what happens? How do you get there? Why do you go there to get here? So it's, a, it's, a, it's such a great question. I think in, how many of us in this room are actually in real estate? Can I see a raise of hands? Okay. And then for those that aren't, I assume you're in sales. Can I see a hand for people that are in sales? Being in a business where, the way I see it, we write our own paychecks, right? You have to get obsessed. You have to get obsessed with what you do. And what I mean by that is you have to live it, breathe it, sleep it. And I have always been of the mindset that you have to love what you do. And if you don't love what you do, why the fuck are you doing it? Because we spend hours upon hours out there trying to make a career of ourselves and trying to make the best of ourselves that why be miserable in what you do? So I found at a very early age that real estate made me happy, it got me excited, it made me want to be a better person, it made me want to be successful. So I knew that if I wanted to be successful, I'd have to get obsessed with what I'm doing if I was going to ever compete with the competition. My MO has always been what makes me different to everybody else. We're in this cutthroat industry where there's thousands, 1.5 million dollar, 1.5 million, 1.5 million licensed agents in America, what makes me special? So everything I've always done is how can I be different from the rest? How can I think outside the box and be creative? And when I set my company up seven years ago, I did extensive research on who were the best agents? Who were the most successful agents? Who did I want to be like? And then I would research them and think, how am I going to do it differently that's true to myself? 
So it's all about how can you stay true to yourself and get in front of that and be special, be different, so that people respond accordingly to you. The obsession is such a big part. You know, so you said that, that might have just sounded like a quick little side note. I watch agents come on the team, and they said certain things when they were in the interview, and then they're on, and then I see the way they're working, and I say, oh, you took the job that you thought might be like the thing right. you're supposed to do now in your life. You're not, you, you, there, there is a lack of obsession, of intensity, of passion. And if we could just divide them up into two different groups, the correlation to success would be dramatically on point. That's right. I believe in success breeds success, right? I love a healthy competition. I hang around successful people. And I don't necessarily mean financially successful people, but I surround myself daily by successful people that are going to make me more successful. And what I mean by that is I want to grow. I want to learn from each of you and people in the room. And we all have similarities, but as long as I can grow organically, hang around successful people, I will always become more successful. And Seven years ago, we set up our business in Beverly Hills. We didn't have a contact in our phone book. We didn't know a single person. I hardly knew where Beverly Hills was. I knew I had GPS, which failed me many, many times. But I knew that no matter what, I had certain things in this business that were going to make me successful. One of which, which I hope everyone in this room does if they're looking to grow, is door knocking. I don't know how many of you in this room go door knocking. Can I see a, a show of hands of people that do? Excellent. Door knocking for me costs zero dollars. And if you have a formula and a strategy of how you're going to go door knocking, you're going to Wait a second. Why are you talking about something you would, you would never do, never have done, and no one will ever joke. believe you did? So I door knocked for... I've got so many great door knocking stories. But I door knocked for the first 12 months of our business. The first 12 months, I've had dogs bite me. I think I've been spat on. I've had doors slammed in our face. And I've also done six to $10 million deals because of it, because I wasn't prepared to give up. David and I realized at a very early stage that fear was something that we had to diminish and make so small in our vocabulary and throw it so far behind us that it just became something we were never scared of. Fear for me is false evidence appearing real. And I'm sure some of you have heard of it. It's, I've always lived by the opposite of fear is faith. And the reason that I stand by that is I always have to have faith in my ability no matter what I do. And I've door knocked Leonardo DiCaprio's house, Dr. Dre's house, uh, the list goes on. But one of the very first deals that David and I did was a door knock in Bel Air, on a cul-de-sac, on a street called Perugia Way, and we door knocked it. We paid rock, paper, scissors for who was going to door knock it. And Did I you lost. want to win or lose? No, no, no. I wanted to win. Okay. And I lost, as per the usual. And I rang the doorbell, and this lovely lady comes up to the driveway, and she says, go away. We're not interested. And I said to her, and I had a strategy with how I would door knock, which I'll share with you. But I said, please take my business card. Our client does not care about what this home looks like, but he's motivated by its location. She didn't even know what I was talking about. She takes my business card, and two days later, I get a call from a trust attorney. And to cut a long story short, that was our first door knocking deal after about four months. We closed it for six and a half million dollars. Our client has since torn that house down and will be listing it for $45 million in probably three or four months from now. So the moral of the story is if you keep going and you don't give up, door knocking can be very lucrative and just never be scared and have a strategy with how you're going to attack it. So let's dive into the strategy, right? Yes. Everybody here wants to know exactly how the hell do you go door knock a six million dollar house? Like what, how did you decide where to door knock? What did you door knock with? I'm going to tell you guys right now, whether you door knock a $200,000 house or a six million dollar house, guess what? It makes no fucking difference, except your paycheck's going to be 20 times as large. And I used to trade commodities, and I used to work in the most cutthroat boiler room. And I was trained so early on that every single time I hear the word no, I'm closer to a yes. 
and it stuck with me. It really stuck with me. And I was also taught that just because I'm broke, it doesn't mean the other person on the end of the phone is broke. Okay, now what that means to me is your mentality. It's not money, it's mentality and it's mindset. For some reason, each of us are comfortable to go and knock a $500,000 property, but we're not comfortable to go and knock a six, seven, ten million dollar property. Why? Because it's false evidence appearing real. So I discovered that I was gonna go and start door knocking on the high end. Everything about door knocking has to come with a strategy. Okay, you knock on a door, 10 other people have knocked on that door either that week or within that month. They are waiting for us to knock on that door and tell us why they shouldn't open it. So you have to find a unique reason of why they should listen to you and why they should open that door. Back then, I realized a huge gap in the market. I had no clients, no money, nothing. But what I learned was developers were buying land, right? Developers have how much loyalty? Zero. Developers wait on who brings them the best deal. So what I figured out was, well, I'm going to door knock on teardowns. And I'm going to find the deals. I don't have the developers, but if I have the deals, I'm going to have the developers. And so I door knocked until my feet hurt, until I had something concrete. And then I would go to a construction site, ask the property manager, who owns this? I would then wait for them. They would show up. And then I would introduce myself and offer them a deal. And right there, you're creating opportunity, right? And when I would get to the door, I would always have a high energy about me, right? If you walk into somebody's house and you're like this, and I don't know how many of you go and listen to Tony Robbins or have seen Tony Robbins, but you walk in and you're like, hey, uh, hi, I'm James. Can I have your business card? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fuck, I'm scared. They're going to tell you they're not interested. But if you ring on that doorbell, and, hi, I'm James Harris from the agency. How are you? Firstly, they don't know who the hell I am, but they're going to say, I'm good. How are you? Fantastic. I've got an amazing opportunity for you. I've got a buyer that's interested in this property particularly. They've seen everything else in the area. They're not interested by how this property looks inside, but they're extremely motivated by the location. Would you sell? No, I'm sorry. Hang on, no. Is there a number that would get you motivated to sell this property? Well, hang on a minute. Now they're thinking. So my house is worth two million. Well, shit, I'll take three. So you'll take three? Fantastic. Let me call my client and let me schedule a meeting. And suddenly you've engaged. And I don't care if you have the buyer or you don't have the buyer, but you're now engaging with the person that's just opened the front door. And now you have their contact information, and now you can take a buyer. Go and find that buyer. It's going to be a lot easier to find the buyer than it's going to be to get the listing. But if you get the buyer and take them to the listing, now the seller sees that you've got their best interest at heart, and you've been tenacious, and you've got over the fear of knocking on their door, and you've got them. That is the person a seller wants to work with, right? They want to work with someone that's tenacious, with someone that's hungry, with someone that they think can get them a big number for their property, and now you've got yourselves a client. So the best thing I can suggest to you guys in this room is to be excited, be fearless. If you have a fear, step in front of it and go door knocking. You will make money from door knocking. Thank you. I love that. Thank that's you. Great. Yeah. It's interesting in hearing you say that, why not door knock a two, three, four million dollar home instead? In my mind, I have to imagine in a lot of others, there's almost felt like maybe there's a law against that or something. There's no, right? It it's almost feels that way it's, yeah. to people. It's what you um, make. Like, are you, am I allowed to do that? Yeah. Like, do you really think Congress sat around and said, hey, like, you know, door knocking over a million five is now illegal? No, right? Of course they didn't. So, everything has to be untraditional methods. Sorry. If you want to stand out and be successful in this business where there's so many of us, if you're like everybody else, I'm sorry, it's just not going to work out for you. If you're willing to put 90% into this business, it's just not going to work out for you. It's just not. The barrier for entry to get into this business is so pathetically low. Right? But if you're ready to give this 120% and live it and sleep it and breathe it and go for it, you'll be successful. It really is that simple. And this is a simple business that so many of us make complicated. Keep it simple and follow what the professionals and the people that are already successful are doing in this business to make yourself more successful. What kind of volume in business will you do this year, roughly? 
as a team. Oh, wow. So David and I, and we have a small team, but David and I have already closed for 2019 390 million. Amazing. And we're set to close. And this is your first $300 million year, correct? Pardon me? Thank you so much. I appreciate that. That means so, a lot. Oh, when we were talking over the phone in preparation, and he told me about door knocking, it just blew my mind, right? Because, yeah, we, all, we conceptually understand, no, you didn't just end up on millionaire listing like day one. But somehow we do believe that he was born special or with some kind of, you know, he didn't have to start where we all started, every single one of us, but he somehow got to be born like five levels forward so it was easier. It wasn't easy. Really? You got kicked out of school. You had behavioral issues. You showed up. You knew everybody in Los Angeles, you knew nobody. And you get to the point where you're here and people want to hear your stories. So let's dig deeper into how you get from there, these are your first breakthroughs, to being where you're at now, having an unbelievable year. Um, obviously great momentum and eventually a partnership with David Parnes. That's right. So I just want to make it very clear, nothing about my story has been straightforward at all. Uh, you know, we laugh and we joke, but growing up with a single mother and being thrown out of school and having behavioral issues and being diagnosed with ADHD and everything else under the sun and being told you're never going to make it, you know, that's a really hard pill to swallow. And, you know, I, I've been through hell and back to get where I am today. I've struggled and I'm happy to share this with everyone in the room with alcoholism and addiction. And I'm proud to say I'm clean and sober and have been for a very long time. Thank you, I appreciate that. Uh, and thank you. And, and I guess the, the reason that, and I appreciate that, the reason that I'm sharing that with you is that we all have things that come up in our lives that are going to try and defeat us, right? And things in our lives that are going to try and have us walk from our dreams and our successes that we, we want to achieve. And I have always, always <coughs> stayed so focused in what my dreams, dreams are. You know, I am not all about making money and being rich. I want to be happy. I want to have a healthy balance. And everybody in this room, I don't care who you are, we all struggle with a healthy balance right? This business is 24-7. It's all about a healthy balance. I don't know how many of you are in teams in this room, uh, but back to Daniel's question, I am a team. David Pons and myself, we've been friends from day one. We, we grew up together. Our mothers are best friends, and we're business partners. And I truly believe in a business partnership being a huge asset to anyone's business, provided that you can find your right hand someone that compliments you, someone that has the strengths that you don't have, someone that you can trust implicitly, someone that when you do go door knocking, you can laugh and joke whilst one person sits in the car and the other idiot's door knocking 300 houses. One person's successful, the other one isn't. You lift this one, that one. It's so important that you either have a mentor a business partner, someone that you trust, someone that you can talk to, but most importantly, someone that can make a better person out of you, right? Because again, and I'll keep saying it, success breeds success. If you hang around successful people that are gonna bring positive energy in your life, it's going to make you more successful. So what I've learned over the years is that I had to weed a lot of people out of my life and I'm not referring to people that have no money, just so we're very clear. I had to weed a lot of those people out of my life that had negative energy, that weren't bringing anything and fulfilling my life and making me a better person. And so for anyone in this room, I always recommend just hang around people that are gonna make you a better person and make you more successful in life generally. Partnership, real quick before we jump off the topic, I just, people I think often consider a partner was fail. Mm -hmm. What have you learned about a partnership? You said someone that really compliments you, and maybe you've already answered it, but I, I, just, I just know that there will be people that still will walk out and create partnerships, sometimes for the wrong reasons. What are the wrong reasons you see people create partnerships for? I like to focus on the right reasons. I think trust is everything. If you don't have trust with who you're working with, 
how can that person better you? I asked these guys when I arrived, I said, are you guys business partners? He said, sort of, but we're actually competitors. <laughs> but guess what? They're sitting here together, probably making each other better people today in some shape, way, or form. And so a business partner doesn't need to be something that you form that becomes a 50-50 partnership. A business partnership, to me, is a meeting of the mind, someone that can better you and, and, and show you your strengths and allow you to come out and become a better person. But if you can find somebody that you can team up with that will make you a better person and allow you to become more successful, where you think that two of you is better than one, then I highly encourage partnering with somebody so that you can be there to help each other grow. I'm, I'm a huge component of that. All right, so everybody in here would love to sell tons of multi-million dollar homes. What advice do you have? Let's say somebody's consistently been selling the, the median price, $500 million homes here in San Diego, but they want to get to that next level. What advice do you give them? That's a great question. I think for anybody that's hungry and anybody that wants it, you have to really go for it. It goes back to what I was saying before. If you're selling a $500,000 home, you're capable of selling a $5 million home. I think you need to train, change up your strategy. I think open houses. I'm always thinking when I do these talks of how I can help others that don't necessarily want to go out and spend $20,000 on marketing themselves or use the tools that you have right in front of you that cost zero. Door knocking, open houses, social media, be consistent with what you do, be creative, think outside the box. If you work at a brokerage, be the first person on Monday morning that emails the office and says, Who can I, whose open house can I sit? And ask those agents that represent those two, three, four, five million dollar listings if you can be the person that sits that open house on a Sunday. Then when you sit that open house on a Sunday, the number one most important thing to have at your fingertips in this business is information. Information is key. So if you're sitting a two, three million dollar open house on a Sunday, you need to know about the five other homes that have sold within a half mile radius, the five other homes that are in escrow. You need to know what's trading, what's removed contingencies, and what's happening so that when that buyer comes through the front door, if that house isn't for them, you have five other houses to offer them, you have five other houses to tell them about that comp to this house. Suddenly they realize, my God, this person really knows what they're talking about. It sells. Having knowledge and power and information inside sells. People want to work with people that have the knowledge and information. It goes back to living it, sleeping it, and breathing it. If you're willing to put in the work and learn and get excited about it and get passionate about it, you're yawning, sorry, you will be successful in this business. I'm giving you my word on that. And so people are thinking, oh, I can't hold these big listings open. I'm just going to get looky lose. I'm not ready for it. Like, how do they get motivated to, to step up? Because I think there's so much that's mental. I'm sorry, but everything that we do in our business is mindset, right? Again, your posture, the way that you speak, the way that you address people, the way that you market yourself, dress for success. I could show up in jeans and a t-shirt today. You wouldn't think much different, but you'd think, what is he doing? Okay, I like to dress for success because it makes me feel good. I like to smell good. I like to have my hair looking right because it makes me feel good. So that when I'm talking to you, you feel good. When I'm filming our TV show, I spray a shitload of cologne on me and the producers look at me, they go, the camera can't smell you. I said, but I can smell me. I want to smell good so I feel good. So if you want to get motivated, you have to get excited. You have to want this. You have to know what you're talking about. And you cannot let, and I know in this room, and I'm sure none of us want to admit it, but we all have so much fear inside of us. And fear is what stops us from getting better. Fear is what stops us from getting to that next level. So if you can learn and understand fear, false evidence appearing real, I say it to myself daily because I'm a human being and I get scared. But once I take that fear and I'm able to remove it, I'm able to get in front of it, Nothing, I mean nothing, can stop me. And it can be the exact same for you if you're willing to undertake that mindset. Let's dig into the show a little bit. Your, the best parts of the show, how you use the show, because there's been other people on the show mm -hmm. over the years. They have. Who's some names we actually don't even remember. 
Uh -oh. So it's not that having the show is automatic success or, or, or you know, and, and what have you. It's you've taken a platform and done so much with it. Right. So let's, let's dig into that experience a little bit. So the show has been an amazing six years. We're filming season 12, which is airing in several months. I've been on over 80 episodes. The show is an amazing platform that is aired in over 130 countries. There's two million viewers that watch it a week. And it's everything that I could have ever expected and more, okay? But with the show comes risk, paranoia, manipulation, and many, many other things that none of you in this room would even think about or consider when you thought about this show. And I remember before I started the show, I was speaking to a very big client of mine who's a big actor, and I said, shit, I'm really worried. There's this show, and he's like, what show? And I told him, he's like, oh, it's a pile of shit. Don't do it. I was like, okay, well, I, I just want to just kind of pick your brains on this show. He goes, Are you, have you got any editing rights? I said, nope, there's no editing rights. He goes, well, I'm going to tell you one thing, James. He goes, if you're an asshole, you'll look like an asshole. But if you're not, they can't make you look like an asshole. And those very words really stuck with me because in six years of being on the show, I have always tried to just stay true to who I am. And David has tried to stay true to who he is. And I will tell each of you in this room, to be successful, you don't need to screw people over. You don't need to be unethical. You can be honest. You can go out and do things your way not the way that others are doing things. And you can be special in your own way to be different so that you can create your own success. So we've remained honest, transparent, hardworking, ethical. And although there's drama and we have these fights on the show, I've even tried to stay real to exactly who I am there. And I truly believe whether it's TV or real life, if you are true to who you are, that will come through and it will be received well. And I hope none of you think I'm an asshole on the TV show. And if you are, I don't want to know. Uh, but the show's been an amazing six years. And, you know, it's, it's been an amazing platform to expand our business. But it's not always been that way. And it doesn't take away the hard work that each of us have to put in to get to that next level. How do you end up getting on it? That's a great one. I was driving home from work six years ago. David had just broken up with his ex-fiance, and I get a call from a casting agency, and it's this lady, and she says, we're casting for this show, Million Dollar Listing, and I thought we were being pranked. I really thought it was somebody winding us up. And I said, okay, well, I called David. He's like, I fucking love that show. David loves reality. So I was like, fantastic. So the next day, I'm like, but Dave, I think it might be a prank. So the next day, we start Skyping this really attractive lady, and David's just broken up with his fiance, and I think it's a prank, and he's flexing his muscles in the camera on the Skype call, and I'm pushing him, and we're joking and laughing, and she apparently loved that. And fast forward about three months, they went through, I think it was 2,000 agents, and we ended up being the last 10 and they sent a full crew out with each of us for an entire day for eight hours of filming. And long story short, we got it. And it was, it was great. That's awesome. Yeah. Looks like a ton of fun. It is. And you really do, just to answer your question, um, I could vouch for the fact that you show up on the show, on our phone calls, and right here, the exact same way. Thank you, man. That the exact, sense. exact same way. Thank you. Authentically. I got a simple question. What yes. motivates you? Well, what motivates me 10 years ago and what motivates, what, what motivates me today is very different. Um, what motivates me today uh, is family. I have a wife. I have two daughters, uh, Sophia and Chloe, who are six and 10. They mo I've got goosebumps and I'm emotional. They are my world. They motivate me to become a better person. Uh, and everything that I do now whilst I'm extremely competitive, as I'm sure most of us in this room are, um, I do everything to grow for my family. I came from a world where my father was absent um, and my mother raised me on her own and I came from a less fortunate background 
Um, I never went without, but it was, you know, it was a less fortunate background. And for me today, I just want to make sure that my children, whilst I keep them grounded and level-headed, are never in a position where they have to worry. Um, I'm also very competitive, and I'm even competitive with David, which is also a great thing about a partnership. David and I have a business partnership. Some say it's like a marriage. Uh, he's the wife. And <laughs> we are so competitive with each other. Everything we do is 50-50, yet we are so competitive with it. What have you got going? Well, what have you got going on? So if I do a $20 million deal, he's trying to do a $25 million deal, and that's a healthy competition. So I'm always trying to stay ahead, um, and for me, it's all about being fresh with what we do. I want to stay relevant, so I'm always looking at ways to be different, to think outside of the box, to create methods of branding and marketing myself that are different from everybody else, but are also in the same format as who I am as an individual. Let's dig into that. Let's dig into some of those uh, innovations in marketing and process. Um, I know that it's daily that my, my biggest fear is that we've created these different systems or marketing programs or, or just processes that have given us wonderful results, but I wonder, is it time to change it? Is it time to, you know, is it, getting duplicated too much? Is it not different the way it used to be? You know, we created it, it was different, now it's not different. And so I'm so scared to fall into not being unique and not being different. How do you audit that process? How do you keep your pulse on it? And give us an idea of something that you just thought was kind of a badass thing you did with your marketing or with your clients. There's so many different things that we do. I think the first thing to really understand in this business are no two properties are the same, right? I can't give you a relative comparison here, but in Los Angeles, if I'm selling a property that is in the Hollywood Hills and I'm selling a property that's in the Beverly Hills Flats, they're two completely different buyers. So why would I ever market those two properties the same? Right? One's a bachelor, one's a family. So why am I trying to market a property exactly the same if they're very different? So in everything that I do and everything that all of you should be doing is thinking about what property am I selling? Who's buying this property? Who's my demographic? What's going to make this property relevant? What's going to make me relevant? And how can I do it without spending an absolute fortune? So in every single listing that I have, I like to identify who I'm dealing with, what I'm dealing with. We sold a property about a year ago in Culver City. We broke all records and we went around Culver City on Instagram Live. We created hours and hours of footage that we then recirculated, educating people on Culver City. Culver City has its own police department, its own fire department. It's very similar to Beverly Hills. Here's the parks, here's the libraries, here's the schools. And then we repeated that content on so many different platforms and we actually found the buyer who was living in the Hollywood Hills that couldn't afford the Hollywood Hills so wanted better value for their money and they ended up buying in Culver City. We have sold properties over Facebook, sponsored ads, direct marketing, <coughs> retargeted marketing. I'm telling you guys, this is a business that if you will just stop and think about who your buyer demographic is for that property and how you can market it, it's going to sell. But if you take a property or you go door knocking and do everything the exact same way everybody else does, it's boring, it's not unique, it doesn't get anybody excited. I had a guy, I wish I had my phone, texting me from Florida through Instagram, who I've decided to kind of mentor, and he was like, what do you think of uh, putting leaflets through people's door? I was like, no, stop, that is what every, I go home and I have 10 leaflets in my door. I don't even look at them, they go in the trash. Because that to me is so vanilla, it's what everybody else is doing. So I'm thinking, how can I be different? What can I do? And no, it's not giving them a calendar or an umbrella. It's getting personal, it's getting in front of them, it's getting excited, it's cap catching them when they're not thinking they're gonna be caught. It's everything you need to do needs to be true to who you are but it needs to be unique. So my best advice is for each of you to really think about that. Who you are, what your intentions are, who you want to be, how you want to become more successful, and what makes you different to everybody else. I would really dive into that because that is how 
we all get to the next step in being more successful. And I need to continue to do it every day to become more successful. So I urge you all to really sit down and focus on that, write that out, and, and think about it. I understand you're famous for getting lost in the back roads of Los Angeles. Oh my god. I get laughed at all the time. Well, to this day, I don't know where the hell I'm going. But it served you great purpose at one point. So there's so many amazing stories about getting lost. But I, very early on in my career, I had this lovely client, lady called Janice. Her budget was, I think, one and a half million. You would have thought it was 150 million. I had no clients. I had nothing going on. And I really just, this was it. I would talk to my wife about this lady. Bear in mind, guys, I got into real estate with nothing when my wife was seven months pregnant. And I quit my career where I was making a lot of money, but I was miserable. My wife wanted to kill me, but that's a whole different subject. Uh, but I was passionate about it, and I picked up this one client, and she was born and raised in Los Angeles. And it's great. Uh, I'll never forget it. And, and, and we went and saw six, seven homes that day, and I had nothing else going on. So what I used to do was I'd drive to each of the homes before I even had to take the client out so that I wouldn't get nervous when I was taking the client out and I'd have my folder with all the properties. But on this day, I decided that I was going to put it all in the GPS. And this lady decides to follow me. And again, she's born and raised in Los Angeles. And my GPS is taking me the most fucked up way. I'm going down roads I've never seen. They're narrow. I'm sweating. I can feel the sweat coming through my back. I'm like, she's going to think I'm a total moron. This is going off. I don't even know. Maybe I put the wrong address in the GPS and we're going to a completely different place. Anyway, we get to this house. She gets out the car. She goes, my God, I've lived in Los Angeles my whole life. You really do know the back roads. I was like, oh, thank God. Thank God for that. Uh, and we ended up selling her a property. But uh, yeah, to this day, people laugh. They're like, how do you do it? You don't know where the hell you're going. But the thing is, is I don't need to know where I'm going I've got ways. I need to know how I'm going to be different, how I'm going to be successful, what I'm going to do. Getting there in the car is OK, right? But I need to figure out my plan and my strategy of how I'm going to execute deals, how I'm going to grow my business, how I'm going to go after listings. Like Getting somewhere for me isn't something I need to like really go out. If I'm just crap with geography, I have to accept I'm just crap. Right? But I have to focus on what are my positives? Where are my strengths? What do I enjoy doing? It's people, it's talking, it's negotiating, it's being creative, it's getting aggressive, it's in a good way, but it's, it's focus on what your strengths are, right? Because I could take the next three months learning about driving around Los Angeles, but I'd rather take the next three months thinking about how I'm going to grow my business and make more money. And, you know, so focus on your strengths, not your weaknesses. You've mentioned social media a few times. Yes. What would one or two specific strategies be that you would recommend? The number one strategy is consistency. You know, so many of us come up with a great plan on a Saturday and we're like on Monday morning, I mean, oh, it's going to go off. It's going to be incredible. I'm going to do an Instagram live and then I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And then for the next week, we crush it. And then by the following week, it's all been forgotten about. And that's the same you are forgotten about if you're not consistent. And so my best advice is to be consistent with no, whatever you do in this business. We send out newsletters every single month, and we have done for seven years. I think we may have got three or four listings off of it, but guess what? That's paid me back 10 times what I've spent on it. And it's the consistency and the repetitiveness of being relevant, right? So be relevant. Number two is you are your brand. Perception. People only know what they see. I actually sat with a friend of my wife's yesterday and she was showing me her Instagram. She says, what do you think? And I was really shocked. And she would posted these photos, and I'm sorry if any of you have done it, outside a $200,000 home with a sold sign, with an arrow, with the clients, and it said sold. And I was like, look, it's sweet. But now you're putting yourself in the category of you sell $200,000 homes. How are you going to grow? How are you going to go to the next step? She goes, well, what do I do? I said, well, the first thing is every single Tuesday from 11 till 2 in Los Angeles, you can go and visit a number of open houses that range from a million to $50 million. We have open houses. I was like, if people only see what you put out there, why don't you go to these houses and do a 
great Instagram of, hey, look at me, I'm at this $10 million house, it's beautiful, it's in Beverly Hills, and start putting out content that puts you in a light that shows you that you're trying to get to the next step because people only know what they see. And when we had nothing, nothing, we were putting out this relevant content that was sexy and it was different, and people started saying, who are these guys? And we quickly became the Bond Street Boys. Uh, and Josh Altman, I think, called us the Spice Girls, but that's irrelevant. <laughs> I prefer the Bond Street Boys, but we've, we've been called everything. But the thing is, is you have to stay relevant, unique, and, and it has to be sexy and different. You've mentioned strategy and plan half a dozen times. Yes. How much time do you spend on that in an average week, average month? Everything in this business is about strategy. If you're just throwing mud at the wall and expect it to stick, it's not going to. But if you're willing to sit down and come up with a strategy and try and be unique with that strategy, everything I do has a meaning behind it. If I'm going after a listing, I know exactly who I'm going after, what my marketing content's gonna look like, what my strategy's gonna look like, what I'm gonna say, how I'm gonna say it, when I'm gonna call them, when I'm gonna email them. Everything I do has an A to Z strategy. And I think that unless you have a strategy and you slow down and you think about what you're gonna do, how can you expect to get that listing or, or complete that sale if you're not competitive in your mindset when you're just going in with a knee-jerk uh, reaction? We have time for... I got one more. Yeah, yeah I want to know, because we're going to leave a little time for some Q&A here, um, but what I want to know, tell us something about the show we wouldn't know just from watching it. Oh my God, then I get fired. <laughs> uh, that, yeah, you know, everyone asks, uh, are the deals real? Every single deal on the show is real. Uh, you know, this show has become very successful. It's been on the air for 12 seasons and the audience get very educated and so every single deal is real. Um, I don't know what to tell you that I, I don't want to get in trouble and there's cameras <laughs> everywhere. Keep watching the show, thank you. <laughs> we'll leave it right there. But let's open it up for questions. Yes, sir. Newer agent wants to know two or three things to focus on. Two or three things to focus on is who you are as an individual and who you want to become. And my best advice is to identify the competition that you relate to, right? Do your research on the other agents and strive to be equally, if not more successful than them. And I know that that's so much easier said than done, but you have to have someone that you're following to put yourself in a more successful light. And I do recommend door knocking and I do recommend open houses and I do recommend perhaps joining a team. If you're struggling and you're finding it hard and you want to learn, perhaps try and find a team that you can join or become a part of so that you can become a part of something else that's bigger than you that can allow you to grow organically. Back. As a uh, an agent in the business 20 years, stay relevant. Again, that's a great question. You know, I think an agent that's been in the business 20 years ago, the way that an agent marketed themselves 20 years ago is very different to how you market yourself today. But you have the tools. You know what those tools are. It's social media, it's marketing, it's digital, it's print. And nothing has changed in terms of the business. You're still connecting buyers and sellers, but I think you have to do it in a more relevant fashion and utilize the tools that we have in front of us, such as social media and digital marketing. You know, today people want to see sexy marketing. They don't want to just see the same Sotheby's, Coldwell Banker, Leaflet, Handout, Mailer. So to be relevant, you have to stand out and be creative and, and be unique to who you are as a brand and not just piggyback off the broker's brand. Be unique and, and be different. Mary. Can you quickly walk us through the framework when you meet with a seller? Absolutely. So when I meet with a seller, everything's about strategy. Depending on who the seller is, I'm gonna tailor my listing, uh, my listing presentation to that seller. If I feel that that seller might be more inclined to look for an international buyer, 
which let's be honest, who doesn't think their home's perfect for an international buyer, then I'm gonna start targeting my presentation more towards an international presentation. I'm gonna make sure that I give them past relevant examples of what I've done. I'm gonna show case studies of what I've done and what's worked and what I think could work for this property. I think that we all work at brokerages. If you don't have a great case study for that listing, go and find another agent in your office that does. Use theirs. Bring someone else onto the listing if you don't think you can get it on your own. Half of something is always better than all of nothing. My personal recommendation is really understand who your seller is and then tailor everything that you do around who you think that person is and the demographic of who's gonna buy that property. Right. Yes. Absolutely. It's such a phenomenal job with the selection of your speakers. I can't think everybody should be here. So thank you so much. Thank oh, you. that's good job, guys. Hey, hey, guys. I'm going to do a little less of Peter. My name is Connie. Hi, and Connie. I just want to say, James, that you're one of my favorite speakers because I did not expect this from you. Oh, and I'm thank you. Thank you for your show. I can't wait to watch it. Thank you. <laughs> My God, I must look like a real dick on the show. Thank you so much. I'm totally, I'm joking. You're, you're sweet. Absolutely. So for me, everything, God, I wish my wife was here to hear me say this. She'd be so proud. Uh, but by the way, thank you for all the kind words. That means the world to me. Everything in our business and in our daily lives is about giving back. I have an alarm on my phone. I'm not going to lie. I don't follow it every single morning. But at 7 a.m. it goes off and it says, be of service. Because unless you can give back, how can you expect to receive? And that's a whole different topic of conversation that I would have any other time. Um, but I'm all about giving back. And whether that means showing up here and speaking to all of you wonderful people with not expecting anything back, or it means servicing my client and going above and beyond in a real estate transaction that goes outside of just selling their home, taking my commission and running, or whether it's giving to a charity, or whether it's helping my family or someone in my family. Everything in my life, one way or the other, is giving back in some shape, way, or form. And I think that if you are out there expecting to just take, 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 it might work for you in the short term, but unless you open up and give back, don't ever expect to be able to truly grow. And that's a much bigger conversation, but I'm glad that you asked. Thank you. Good. Guys, unfortunately, we have time for one final question right here. It is strong. It's pressure. <laughs> ah. It's a great, great question, and I will answer that for me, and my reason might be very different to yours, but I know that when I represent you, I'm not gonna sit on my ass, put your property on the MLS, and just wait for a buyer. I'm gonna market your property aggressively. I'm gonna go out and be creative. I'm gonna think of ways to go out and find a buyer. I'm gonna take the property international. I'm going to work my ass off to make sure that your property sells. And I'm gonna go above and beyond in every single shape, way, and form that I can to overcompensate what you're gonna pay me to sell your property. And everyone can say that in their own roundabout way, but it's about backing it up with proof and actually being able to show people what you're gonna do for them. People don't wanna hear you talk, they wanna see action. And again, we don't have very long here, but it's all about who are you as a person, what are your strengths. My strengths are speaking to people, getting in front of people and connecting dots. I think each individual needs to figure out what their strengths are and sell themselves to that person so that the seller doesn't even have a decision to make other than to work with you. 
And then the key is actually following through on it, right? Because right. it's one thing to talk that talk, but you got to walk that walk too. I see so many people fluff that they're going to do all these amazing things and they get the listing and turn it over to somebody else and nothing happens that right. they said. So you got to follow through on that. James Harris. Guys, thank you so much, boys. Thank you. Thank you.